sleepy suburb on the outskirts of Durham, the cathedral city in the northeast of England. A place where people take real pride in appearances. It's the kind of area that local estate agents describe as much sought after and desirable. When George and Christina Button moved here in 1998, they felt they'd made it, and so did their relatives. I was quite amazed that they bought this huge house. <laughs> Have they won the lottery was the first thing I thought. <laughs> and I thought, well, he would have told us that, I think, if he won the lottery. <laughs> Sadly, there was no lottery win, but that didn't stop Christina Button from wanting all the trappings to go with her expensive new home. I think Christina wanted to be classy. She wanted to have, you know, the nice things, you know, the best foods and the best shoes, and that's how she was. But the Button suburban dream was not all that it seemed, and the family was about to be hit by tragedy. You read about these things happening in the paper, it's always something that happens to someone else. You look back and you think, this sort of thing doesn't happen to our family. It's as if you're on the outside now, watching uh, something on the television, a, a movie. As dusk fell on Monday, March the 3rd, 2003, the Button family was on the move. Their lodger, Christina's nephew, had already left the house when Christina and George were preparing to take their dog, Laddie, out for a walk. It seemed to be a normal evening routine, but there was nothing normal about this particular evening. Three people left the house, but only two were to return. What happened that night was to lead to a bloody crime that shocked even hardened detectives. George and Christina Button first met in 1993, and although their family was happy for the couple, some were surprised by the 21-year age difference. Because he hadn't had relationships in the past, I think when a 20, 22-year-old woman starts to make a fuss of you, you're going to be flattered. And it seemed to escalate the relationship very, very quickly, and that's what concerned people. After a courtship of 18 months, the couple were married in October 1994. They were married in Sunderland, the Redchester office, and there was a bridesmaid there with another bridesmaid. It was a good day, was, everything went off perfectly. Some found Christina's manner abrupt, but the couple seemed to make a good team. People perceived early on that she was quite dominant, but I suppose you just think opposites attract. He was the very quiet, gentle guy, and she was the life and soul of the party, and people just thought they'd clicked. Christina's influence on George was immediate. He had always been careful with his money, but now his young wife brought about a change in him. His life changed for the better. Um, he was doing things which he hadn't been doing. He went to the theater, um, the wealth of meals, so his life did change a lot. In 1996, the couple shared some very special news with George's brother and niece. When we found out that Christina was pregnant, everyone was absolutely delighted, um, really, really pleased. My uncle George, obviously, because of his age, I don't think he ever thought he would be a dad. George was absolutely over the moon. He was like a dog with two tails. He, he couldn't, he was, Ecstatic, he was on cloud nine. He was so pleased, it was unbelievable. Two years later, the couple moved to a leafy suburb near Durham. They bought a newly built house directly opposite George's niece and immediately made an impact. Christina was like the social secretary of the street, really. I would often see the neighbours having dinner parties and evenings out, and the ladies on the street would have a Christmas party night, which she would organise. She was very, very good at that life and soul of the party, very sociable. But the dynamics of this happy household were about to change forever. George took pity on Christina's troubled young nephew, and soon afterwards, Simon Tannerhill moved in. My Uncle George seemed, at the time, quite happy that he was there, they were helping him out. I think he'd fallen out with, with his parents and Christina had offered him somewhere to stay. 
Simon settled in and soon became part of the family, helping around the house and going out for a beer with George. You know, it was a family, Christina, the little girl, my Uncle George and Simon, because he was living there. Um, they would go for meals and, and I think they did socialise a little bit together. He was a, a kind guy and was helping out, you know, my Uncle George was older, you know, he was working. So why not have someone help out around the house and with the DIY and things? But the Buttons family's world was about to be changed forever. Around 7.30 on Monday the 3rd of March 2003, Clyde Best was driving down a dark country lane near the Buttons' house. He spotted something suspicious blocking part of the road. Clyde decided to investigate, but upon closer inspection he discovered that the obstacle was actually the body of an unconscious man. Clyde didn't know the man, but he would be haunted by his name from this night on. The man's name was George Button. But how did George end up lying alone in a dark country lane fighting for his life? Everything pointed towards a tragic traffic accident. And the way he was lying was though he had been hit. It could have been by a wing mirror of a car and knocked him down. And that was, that's what I thought had happened. On Monday, 3rd of March, 2003, George Button was found unconscious on a dark country lane less than a mile from his home in County Durham. His injuries were severe, and initially he was thought to be the victim of a hit-and-run road traffic accident. Upon discovering George, Clyde Best had gone to find help and returned with local resident Jeff Lockerbie and his wife Sarah, a trained first aider. I laid the blanket over the victim and noticed there was a lot of blood coming out of his mouth and ears and that he was making low snoring noises, which is an indication that he had a, um, a head injury and there was an awful lot of blood lying around. I also went over and tried to help uh, the victim and as we were doing this, we could hear the sirens in the background of an approaching police car. And at that point, the police officer came and he really took over, didn't he? Yes, he did. When PC Paul Blair arrived on the scene, he was shocked by what he saw. I've seen a lot of people who've been involved in serious incidents and you, you just get an indication as to how bad injuries can be. And that was one of the worst I'd seen. PC Blair immediately checked for signs of life and found that despite extensive head injuries, George was fighting to stay alive. The victim was unable to speak, barely conscious and uh, drifting into unconsciousness. I feared the worst. Paramedics were soon on the scene and fearing that they might lose George at any minute, they raced against time to stabilize his condition and take him to hospital. As the ambulance sped towards Durham University Hospital, PC Blair spotted that George had suffered another, more unusual injury. Once the victim was taken into the ambulance, I noticed the injury to his hand. He had a finger missing. One possibility would be that the injury to his hand was a defensive wound, as if the victim had put his uh, hand up to protect his head. Back at the scene of the incident, the Accident Investigation Unit was combing the area, looking for clues to explain what might have happened to George. There was nothing that suggested to me that the vehicle had been involved. There was, there was no tyre marks whatsoever, there was no vehicle, debris whatsoever, and the scene itself just wasn't reminiscent of a, of a hit-and-run accident scene. At the hospital, the full extent of George's injuries was becoming obvious. His head had probably swollen twice, if not three times its normal size. All his fingernails were ground down and all dirty, as if he'd been sort of scrabbling at the ground. And I remember his knees were very grazed, which, you know, it makes you think that he hadn't been knocked unconscious straight away. There, there had been a time when he was on all fours and, and had obviously suffered. 
As the family tried to comprehend how serious the situation was, Christina repeatedly asked doctors if her husband would ever speak again. I remember Christina kept asking, will, will he speak? Will he talk? I'd taken it in that he was never going to speak again. He was never going to wake up again. And I just thought, my God, she's being so hopeful. And indeed, as the family maintained their bedside vigil, Fred found out just how serious his brother's injuries were. I don't think I was supposed to hear this because I was sort of standing in the end of this corridor. And this is when the doctor came out of the operating theatre and said that uh, there's major head injuries. We don't, he's not going to recover. Exact words were, he's not going to come out of this. I remember him saying those words. He's not going to come out of this. The police still didn't know how George ended up with such serious injuries, so a senior detective was brought in to lead the investigation. The officers who went there felt things weren't right. There was something suspicious about it. They didn't know whether the man had been assaulted or whether he'd been the, the victim of a, a road traffic accident. With no obvious physical evidence at the scene, George's blood was a vital clue as to what might have happened. What you could see was a pool of blood. What I was wanting was um, any blood splattering, which is much harder to see by the naked eye. And you really need to take a very, very close inspection. And again, that's why the FSS can come up with, again, their, their equipment to try and identify that. And that is what's important to a certain extent to indicate as to whether there's been an assault or whether it's been a, a one-off blow, potentially by uh, being hit by a passing vehicle. The FSS, or Forensic Science Service, was called in to assist the investigation. Didn't really come to any firm conclusions in terms of road traffic accident versus assault. And, and really just um, made suggestions as to items to look at in particular. It was obvious to me that I need to look at um, the injured party's clothing to help build up a picture as to what may happen to him. But the lack of any immediate conclusion from the forensic experts meant that the investigation team had to keep their options open. It was very frustrating because that, to a certain extent, will lead how we are going to structure the investigation and, and what lines of inquiry that we're going to go down. Dave Jones had to make the decision that we were going to investigate it as a parallel investigation. We were going to go down the road traffic accident route as a hit and run, but also go down the assault route. The results of the forensic tests wouldn't be available for some time yet, but Detective Superintendent Jones needed to move the investigation on. I regarded Christina and Simon as being significant witnesses, and I wanted to get a detailed account from both of them as to uh, you know, the events of that, that night and what had happened uh, in the run-up. But before the interview could proceed, Christina was called back to the hospital where she was faced with a life or death decision. George had suffered such serious brain damage that after a series of detailed examinations, his doctors could not find any signs of response in his brain stem. This is about the third test to do, I think it is. Uh, two doctors to do the test, and if there's no response, they turn the machine off at lunchtime. The doctors explained to Christina that there was no chance of George recovering and asked for permission to turn his life support machine off. I don't know how the system works, but I assume that, yeah, that we can't go any further. We want to switch the support machine off, and she must have agreed to that, yeah. I had no input into it at all. The decision wasn't mine to make. Christina watched as her husband and father to her seven-year-old daughter passed away. I held his hand and they just turned the machine off and you just watched the oscilloscope just go from beaten down to the flat line and you knew then that that was all over, all finished. You kind of describe really what it feels like. You're just basically sitting there, absolutely helpless. Nothing you can do, not a thing. Whether his injuries were the result of being hit by a vehicle or an attack, 
George Button's death raised the stakes in the investigation. When George died, that changed the status of the inquiry. We were no longer just looking at either a hit and run or a serious assault. We were able to say this is a murder and we're now looking for the person or persons who have committed the murder. Even though the police were now running a full-blown murder inquiry, Detective Superintendent Jones offered to postpone Christina's interview to allow her time to grieve. But to the amazement of the investigation team, Christina rejected the offer, and barely 24 hours after watching her husband die, she was interviewed about the intricate details of her life with George. Christina insisted that she was ready and she wanted, and she wanted to actually get it out of the way. Uh, at the time, it raised one or two eyebrows. Obviously, I appreciate it's a very distressing time at the moment for you, and I just appreciate that you're coming in to speak to us today. My thought on that was, well, that takes a very determined, hard type of person to be there at the hospital, authorise the, the uh, life support machine to be switched off, and then to, to uh, come and sit down and, and make a witness statement. Christina explained how they were just a typical couple. We didn't propose to us, we just, we just, I don't know, it just happened that we were getting married and we got married in the, the following year, in the September. Bearing in mind that only a day earlier Christina had authorised her husband's life support machine to be switched off, the police were surprised how calm she was. She was fairly in control and, and, and had a good recollection of of the issues and, and of the circumstances prior to uh, George's uh, attack. Simon Tannerhill was interviewed next. He had little to say. Um, I think it's fair to say as well that you actually lived or lived with, uh, with Christina and George. Yeah. So how long have you been doing that? It's about two months. Right. Was there a particular reason for that, that you've moved in there? Well, because me and my dad didn't get on. Whilst the interviews continued, forensic scientist Dr Gemma Escott was making progress in examining the patterns of blood left on George's clothes and reached a conclusion which would redefine the investigation. When a blow is struck onto a person and there's no blood at that first initial blow available to transfer either onto the weapon or um, the surrounding area. But once the, the weapon is lifted away, blood is will well to the surface of the injury, which when a second blow comes in, impact spatter will be generated. That is spots and splashes of blood flying away from that area of impact. This is my case file that was prepared in relation to this case. It gives you an idea of the sort of work that goes into the examination of an item, and in particular um, into a blood pattern analysis. These arrows mark the direction of the representative blood spots. Um, and as you can see, they're radiating away from the area at the back of the head where the injuries were sustained. And that's a characteristic feature of impact spatter. So for that number of stains to have, have been deposited, I would expect at least two. And in fact, I favored three blows to have been struck on um, the back of the head. In my opinion, the the possibility that George Button was involved in a road traffic accident can be discounted. And upon closer analysis of the bone fragments at the point of impact, the case pathologist Dr Nigel Cooper concluded George had probably been hit six or seven times. Dr Cooper was able to, to, uh, to say that this was an assault and a number of blows had been struck with uh, massive force and he indicated that we, we should be looking for um, you know, uh, somebody who was physically a big man. He described somebody swinging uh, something like a baseball bat or an iron bar with the full force of a, uh, a baseball uh, shot. Unknown to the pathologist, the police were already interviewing someone who fitted that description. He was six foot four and weighed 20 stone, Simon Tannerhill. Simon was physically capable of carrying out the, the attack, but it would appear that there was no motive for Simon of his own volition to carry out the attack. 
Within only a few days of the assault on George Button, detectives from Durham Constabulary had identified how he was killed and put together a physical profile of the assailant. But was the assault carried out by a stranger as a random attack, or could the killer be closer to home? What we needed was something which would be either physical evidence or evidence from a witness who knew uh, what had actually uh, happened. On Monday, March the 3rd, 2003, George Button was found unconscious on a dark country lane in the suburbs of the city of Durham, in the northeast of England. The pathologist revealed that the assailant must have been a tall, well-built man, a description that immediately implicated George's nephew, Simon Tannehill. But could the 20-year-old really have been involved in the murder of his uncle? And if so, what would drive him to carry out such a cold, callous act? As Simon and George Button's wife, Christina, continued to be questioned, they were asked to provide details of George's movements on the evening of the attack. We went on separate ways. Yeah, yeah. we didn't, like, stop and talk, and yeah. then him go there, and then me turn and go mm. there. We just sort of crossed the road, and he just headed straight for the lane, and mm. I just... So you went off to the right? Mm. Yeah, to the post office. Right. Christine said she walked off to the, towards the post box with George and she left George uh, taking the dog down Mark's Lane and that was the last time she saw George alive. Meanwhile, Simon said he had driven Christina's car to the nearby petrol station to buy some milk. He then met Christina at the post office so he could return her car. She then drove to collect her daughter from the Brownies while Simon then took his own car and drove to his sister's house to drop off a DVD. Where does your sister live? She lives in South End. All oh, right, OK. Um, and then I just, I just ran in there, dropped it off, said hello. And I didn't see the kids because they weren't downstairs. They must have been in bed. Um, they both then separately returned to the, to the house where uh, they'd um, showered and got, got dressed uh, ready for bed. Although by that time it was only eight o'clock in the evening. At which time George was racing towards hospital in the back of an ambulance fighting for his life. In order to understand how he had met his death, every aspect of George's life was scrutinized. I was able to go uh, to the media, for instance, and say, yeah, we, now, we now know that this is a murder and that's how it's being treated. We need to uh, understand who the victim is, so we need to explore with his family, with his friends. We call it victimology. As detectives delved into the lives of the Buttons, they uncovered a world of debt and domination. George and Christina had moved into a leafy suburb outside Durham in October 1998, buying their dream home in a quiet cul-de-sac opposite George's niece. I was quite amazed that they bought this huge house and wondered how this house was getting paid for. It was a big, big house they bought. Being neighbours gave Helen and Christina the opportunity to spend more time together. And as their friendship blossomed, Helen became aware of Christina's favourite pastime, shopping. Christina liked to spend, you know, Russell and Bromley shoes, for example. Um, it sounds silly now, but the best food from Sainsbury's. Um, it was all, always the best of everything, and that, that's what she wanted. Christina had a particular weakness when it came to treating herself. Probably the main thing she liked to spend the money on was shoes. Um, I don't know if my Uncle George had any idea what Russell and Bromley was, but there were lots of Russell and Bromley boxes. But the nice house, new clothes and her obsession with shoes all cost money. And credit cards up to the hilt and put who's on, do you know? Right. Um, but it's nothing that wasn't manageable, it was oh, getting a spiral out I've of control. I've done the odd pouring of jewellery before, but who, who, mm. <laughs> I think there's hundreds of people have, you know. Mm. And the rest of us who, who live nearby felt that mm. 
there was the whole keeping up with the Joneses, which sounds laughable now, but that's how it was and that's how she was. And I think we recognised that, but because we liked her, we sort of saw it as more of a joke, really. Although George didn't find the situation funny, it soon became clear to the police that neither he nor Simon were in a position to challenge Christina. The picture that was emerging of the household was that Christina was very much the dominant uh, person of the, of the men in the, in the household. Without a doubt, Christina was in control. Despite the age difference, uh, my Uncle George was a very, very passive man, and she was certainly the domineering character in the relationship. But I also think that there would be some things that he didn't know about, for example, the money from from the pawnbrokers. Christina had taken a job working at a family-run pawnbrokers, but in an effort to solve her own financial problems, she made a desperate move. The first my Uncle George knew of it was when the owner turned up at their house and told him that Christina had taken, I think it was 11,000 pounds from the pawnbroker company. The owner said that if she repaid the money, he wouldn't take it further. So they did. The pawnbroker not only wanted his money back, but additionally demanded an estimated £6,000 in interest. Since they already owed around £50,000, the couple had no other option but to remortgage the family home. But Christina failed to learn her lesson, and even though the remortgage cleared their initial debts, they were soon back to square one. At the time of the incident, um, between them, they had uh, 14 uh, different credit cards, the majority of which uh, related to uh, Christina. And um, they, they had debts on those credit cards of, in the region of £60,000. As Christina's relentless spending continued, the couple tried to find new solutions to cope with the ever-increasing repayments they faced. But it was George who had to make the sacrifices. I'm not sure how I found out that my Uncle George was delivering pizza. He was working for a pizza shop on the edge of Durham. I think Christina knew the owner, I'm not certain. I remember being surprised because he wasn't in the best of health. Um, his knees were bad, he had epilepsy, um, and he obviously had his job with the council as well as an electrician, and then he was driving around Durham until the early hours delivering pizza, and that made me think that something must be up. No matter how bad things got, Christina often commented on how one day all of her financial problems would be solved. And I remember her vividly saying that one day she would be a rich young widow. Although I thought it was really distasteful talking like that, you know, just laughed it off and didn't really make a comment. As the police continued to examine the Buttons' lifestyle, they realised just how rich Christina would become in the event of George's death. During the financial investigation, we, we uncovered life insurance policies on, on, on George. They were uh, of a substantial value, which would have more than paid off the debts, would have more than paid off the, the mortgage in relation to the house, and would have left Christine substantially better off of, of hundreds of thousands of pounds. That in itself was, was a huge motive. For the first time, the police had found a motive for the attack on George, but there was nothing more than circumstantial evidence to imply that Christina was involved. The fact remained that at the time of the attack, the Buttons owed approximately £195,000, including the remortgage. But in the event of George's death, the life insurance policies were worth over £450,000. Two of those were quite substantial and were kept up to date, had been paid regularly against a background of considerable debt. The insurance policies would have paid off that debt, uh, repaid the, the mortgage, uh, and still have left uh, in excess of two, £250,000. As 
the police started to put the pieces of the puzzles together, they began to wonder whether Christina could also be involved in George's murder. We obviously had what appeared to be this uh, horrendous financial situation uh, in the household. The relationship between Christina and George and the way she treated George. The police realised that Christina clearly had a motive to kill George, but she wouldn't have been physically capable of carrying out the attack. Could her nephew and lodger Simon have also been involved? And how did you get on with George? Like friends? Yeah. Like friends? It would appear that there was no motive for Simon of his own volition to carry out the attack. Where that was coming from was Christina and the apparent um, sympathy that um, Simon had for her uh, situation at dead. But it was still a question of whether Simon had seen the situation and decided to act on his own or whether he was being induced to do so by Christina. Suspecting that they had potentially uncovered a plot to kill George, the police decided to re-examine Christina and Simon's alibis for the hours leading up to the attack. During that day, we know that Simon had um, feigned illness and taken the day off work uh, sick uh, and was at home. But also that during the day, there had been a number of telephone calls exchange between Simon and Christina. Analysis of mobile telephone records revealed that it was unusual for Christina and Simon to call each other so much during the day. In order to help the police verify her movements on the night of the attack, Christina was able to name a number of people who had seen her and even explain how she would have been caught on camera. She uh, identified to us that there was a house on the, uh, the corner of the estate which actually had private CCTV and indicated, directed us really to that particular premises to, to recover that CCTV to confirm a story. Simon was also able to explain his movements on the night, which again included being caught on CCTV at the local petrol station. Whether it was, was deliberate ploy by both Simon and Christine to catch themselves on CCTV prior to the, the actual uh, assault on George, um, personally I think that's probably something that they have thought about and planned. Although this evidence corroborated Christina and Simon's alibis, statements from eyewitnesses highlighted a discrepancy in the timeline of events. If they had done what they had described, everything could have been done in a matter of two or three minutes, not the 20 uh, minutes that they were describing uh, it had taken. So obviously that in itself was very uh, suspicious. Detective Superintendent Jones discovered there was a period of approximately 17 minutes unaccounted for in the pair's alibis, leading him and his team to formulate their own theory as to what might have happened. What we believe has actually happened is Simon has left the, the, the house prior to George and Christine going out. He's gone to the garage to try and provide himself some sort of alibi. He's then gone down Mark's lane. He's waited there. Christine has then come out with George wasn't normal practice for her to go walk on the dog. That was always George's thing. I think Christine's come out to steer George down towards Mark's lane, which hence the pretense of posting the letter. She's then left George at the top of uh, Mark's lane, knowing fine well Simon is waiting the, uh, further down the lane in the darkness, intending to uh, attack George. And the police found even more irregularities in Christina and Simon's stories. It seemed unusual that Christine would go out and, and, and post letters. The first question that, that, that we asked ourselves was, George was already going out, why didn't she just ask George to do it? And also, it wasn't a really common practice for her to be writing letters, to be paying credit bills, etc., by cheque. So that, again, itself was a little bit unusual. Simon's sister, in her original interview, also contradicted his statement by saying that he was only at her house very briefly. She later changed her story. 
Even though the circumstantial evidence against Christina and Simon seemed strong, concrete proof of their involvement was needed. The police had reached a stalemate. What we needed was something to go with that circumstantial evidence, which would, give, would, would be either physical evidence or evidence from a witness who knew uh, what had actually uh, happened. But the police were about to make a major breakthrough. On Saturday evening, only five nights after the attack, a key witness came forward. Well, to me, the defining moment was when the uncle ran in and informed us about what Simon had told him. That, that's, to me, is when the, when the whole emphasis of the investigation started to change. As police officers from Durham continued to investigate the murder of George Button, they uncovered a mountain of debt generated primarily by his wife, Christina. Inquiries into the Button's lifestyle had also revealed that as a result of George's death, Christina was in line to receive almost half a million pounds from life insurance. The police believed Christina's nephew, Simon, was more than physically capable of carrying out the attack. While circumstantial evidence suggested Christina had a motive to kill her husband. However, the police had nothing concrete to charge the pair with, until now. On the Saturday evening of the first week of the inquiry, we got a telephone call completely out of the, the blue from Simon's uncle, who said that he had some important information uh, regarding what, what, what had happened and he asked to meet with um, some police officers. He basically told us that Simon had approached him uh, a few days earlier and had asked him if he knew if he could get somebody to uh, kill somebody for him. He'd given a cotton and bull story about it was something to do with a, a drugs deal that had uh, gone wrong. When the uncle had said, no, I don't know anybody who can, who can do that thing. It's not the sort of thing that uh, the uncle was into. But Simon had gone into, into more detail. He explained that the bloke would have to be handy, in his words, because uh, the, the person who he wanted to be attacked was a big bloke, and that it would take place in a quiet country lane while the man was walking his dog. Upon hearing about the near-identical attack on George Button, who was six foot two inches tall and 20 stone, the uncle felt compelled to inform the police of his conversation with Simon. Immediately, things started to click into place with our investigation and indicated that this was actually a premeditated attack. That evidence confirmed Simon Tannehill as a suspect. What we still needed to, to find out was the degree of involvement of Christina Button. She certainly had the motive. She certainly had the, the, the ability to plan it. He certainly had the physical presence to be able to do that. He'd given an account which wasn't really checking out in relation to his movements. And we had the information and the evidence in relation to Simon and the uncle and planning to attack a man, walking his dog um, in a secluded area. The police were becoming ever more convinced of Simon and Christina's involvement in what they believed to be a premeditated attack. Did it go right the way back to when the insurance policies were taken out and had this always been the plan? Or was there a, a, a straw that brought the camels back uh, in that things just became so unmanageable uh, financially and uh, uh, that Christina decided that's when George was going to be killed. Detective Superintendent Jones needed to make a key decision. Do we have reasonable cause to suspect that Christina Button and Simon Tannehill are responsible for the murder of George Button? And I took the decision that we did have reasonable cause. Christina and Simon were arrested separately the following morning. I had no idea that Simon or Christina were regarded as suspects in any way. I'd been spending time with them 
you know, having tea with them, making sure that she was all right, uh, trying to be supportive. Um, so no idea at all. Whilst they were being interviewed, forensic teams scoured their home, clothes and vehicles for any evidence that could link the pair to the crime. I think there's no doubt in this case that uh, they were forensically aware. We never actually uh, found any of the clothing that Simon Tannehill was wearing when he was seen on the CCTV at the garage, which in itself was significant. The clothing has obviously been disposed of by Tannehill before returning to the house. And the, the fact that uh, they had both showered and changed by eight o'clock that evening raised our suspicions. As well as disposing of the clothes he was wearing on the night George was killed, police also believed that Simon had got rid of the murder weapon. The pathologist had given us an indication of what type of weapon uh, we should be looking for, and he suggested it would be uh, something like uh, a, a large, heavy uh, iron bar. We know Simon Tannehill used to carry an iron bar. It was part of a heavy-duty uh, carjack, and he had told other people that he carried that in order to defend himself. That iron bar was never found, and although others were, they couldn't be linked to the murder. But Simon's car did reveal another clue, a drop of George's blood. However, since George also had access to the car, the police couldn't rely on this new evidence as concrete proof of Simon's involvement. Although forensic evidence was proving hard to find, the pair's behaviour during police interviews was starting to give them away. Neither of them ever turned on each other. They both just maintained their, their, their story and neither one elaborated or tried to blame, uh, put more blame on, on one or the other. And their unwavering support for each other only convinced the police that the two suspects were both involved in the crime. It was never a question of, I can't believe he's done it, or I can't believe she's done it. It was always um, this kind of mutually sympathetic uh, attitude that they adopted. Although Christina stood to gain almost half a million pounds if George died, the police never uncovered a motive that would drive Simon to kill her husband. Had Christina promised her nephew a share of the money, or was he just desperate to please her? The peculiar nature of their relationship, combined with all the circumstantial evidence, was more than enough to convince the police of their guilt. Because neither of them admitted any guilt, there's obviously a question mark in relation to exactly what role both of them played. Personally, I think she, uh, she was very controlling and she certainly had persuaded and cajoled Simon to do what she wanted to do. He looked up to her, he had some sort of hero worship or, or some sort of fantasy figure in, in, in his mind with her. We never established exactly what the reasons were. The whole point of a, an inquiry of this kind is to achieve justice for the victim. And that means finding and bringing to justice the people who are responsible. When it became apparent that this was a joint enterprise, that's the attitude that we took. We would pursue both of them and bring them both to justice. And on Thursday, March the 13th, 2003, Christina and Simon were charged with the murder of George Button. I was floored by that, I couldn't believe it. Um, but the next thing that concerned me was the fact I would have to, I would have to ring my dad. I didn't believe they'd done it. Then when the police came through and they said they have enough evidence to charge them, I thought, well, they must be pretty sure. In November 2003, the trial reached Newcastle Crown Court. After four weeks of evidence, Fred Button had no doubt about what the verdict should be. When the jury went out, I hoped they were going to come back to the jury because I was convinced then, after what I'd heard at, at the trial, that they were guilty. There's no doubt in my mind that they'd done it. And um, you're sitting there thinking, I hope it'll come back with the right verdict. It took the jury just 45 minutes to make their decision. On the 4th of December, 2003, Christina Button and Simon Tannehill were found guilty of the murder of George Button. They were both sentenced to life imprisonment. In 
In little over a week, detectives from Durham Constabulary had identified the perpetrators of a brutal and vicious crime, a crime that the victim could never have imagined his wife was capable of planning or indeed of carrying out. He was a man who only worked to support his family and the solution to their problems was to kill him. And I really can't think of anything more evil than that. It makes no sense. I mean, to do it for any reason is horrific, but for what, 450,000 pounds? It's just not worth it. The consequences aren't, aren't worth it. It's often I still think back that he almost, well, he almost certainly knew who did it. They left him lying there, and he wasn't dead, they left him lying there. And there's nobody could help him. He just left lying, and I often think that. 